I'd like to ask the Lord for His Word, so He can lead us with the Spirit of the Word. And I'm going to read to you from uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1. The beginning of the Church of Thessalonica. You will know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not in vain. We have been ill-treated and insulted in Philippi, but trusting in our God, we dare announce to you the message of God and face fresh opposition. Our warnings did not conceal any error or impure motive, nor did we deceive anyone. But as God has, as God had entrusted His gospel to us as to faithful ministers, we were anxious to please God who sees the heart rather than human beings. We never pleased you with flattery, as you know, nor did we try to earn money, as God knows. We, we did not try to make a name for ourselves among people, either with you or anybody else, although we were messengers of Christ and could have made our way felt. On the contrary, we were gentle with you, as a nursing mother who feeds and cuddles her baby. And so great is our concern that we are ready to give you as well as the gospel, even our very lives, for you have become very dear to us. <coughs> so I'm going to speak and uh, do a reflection on the Eucharist, and uh, always, always related to this year of faith that we are going to uh, experience in a very special way uh, this year as the church invites us to, um, to experience. And um, I, I would say that uh, the experience of the Eucharist is such an incredible challenge for each one of us because I guess the more that you um, strive to become a better Catholic, uh, the more you understand that you have to get closer and closer to this mystery of the Eucharist. Because the Eucharist is what makes us. And, and really, if we challenge the gift of the faith, we, we will be challenged with the gift of the Eucharist because the Eucharist is our mystical life. We become so mystical just by the gift of the Eucharist. Because the Eucharist, if we conceive it just like it is, even if we don't understand it, don't grasp it intellectually, rationally, still just to know that Jesus is alive in the Eucharist, the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, that alone lifts us into another dimension, another level. You see, you come, I, I see people online to communion, and uh, you can see that there is this great universe flowing through each soul, you know, and people are, are like, like walking into this incredible dimension of the Eucharist, and everyone is taking different steps into the host. Yeah, you, if you could read souls, you will see the amazing mystery of every soul approaching the Eucharist. Even those that think they are indifferent. Because you see, if you get on that line to take communion, you are walking into a dimension that is beyond this earth, beyond your understanding. You know you are taking a quantum leap. You are going somewhere really far. And those people that are not prepared to take the Eucharist, they know they are in a lot of trouble also. But it's just that the flesh is deaf to the fear of God, and then that flesh goes numb into this incredible disobedience of taking the host without being prepared. And you, you, your flesh is numb and deaf and indifferent, but your soul is crying inside going, ooh, whoa, I'm, I'm doing something horrible. See, this is happening inside you. And, and you can't stop it. It's a reality. It's real. Because no matter what you think, and no matter how you deal with the Eucharist, the Eucharist is the Eucharist, which means it's God Himself alive. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the mighty God that created us. And uh, one of the biggest uh, presentations that I received from the Lord about the Eucharist was um, Moses uh, when he would come back from speaking to God and he would come back to 
to face the Hebrews, you know, with the messages. The, the, the uh, Hebrews couldn't face him because he, he was radiating this light from his face. So they had to cover him up with a veil in order to talk to him because he, his, the light that was beaming out of his face was so incredible. And, and, and that God that spoke to Moses is the God that is in the Eucharist, same God. This, this incredible sunshine that comes from above. Now, the Hebrews were going through an incredible teaching and preparation because they were the chosen people and they were to prepare the incarnation of Jesus and they were to be stripped from all the idolatry and all this uh, incredible um, uh, culture of the, of the Egyptians that was completely uh, away from God and things that they acquired through generations. You know, all these centuries they were there and they became Egyptian by culture but they were Hebrew by blood. So God had to strip them from the culture. And that was an easy job. You know, it took 40 years in the desert. Thousands died because they, they couldn't cope with the teachings of God. They went against God and they died. Some days over 20,000 died on fornication or threatening God, challenging God. And uh, so, but this was all a warning and a teaching, especially for us that we have to learn from the history because God gives us this lesson so we learn. It's like uh, what we are experiencing today in the church is a teaching for the generations to come. So we better do it right. We better mark our, our path so that others can see what happened. See, and, and this is our job, our duty is to leave that mark very clearly on the ground for others to learn from it, from our mistakes especially and also from the way that God worked in our lives. You know, sometimes we live of, a, of a, the testimony of grandparents. They, they pass along information as to what God did in their lives and, and sometimes generations feed from that. So now this gift of the Eucharist, this mystery of the Eucharist in our lives as Catholics is for us the biggest challenge, why? Because we have to really um, define ourselves as to how deep are we in the Eucharist. How, the understanding that we have of the power of the Eucharist and what it does in our lives. You know, um, you can see, as I was saying before, people uh, facing the Eucharist on the line to communion in church. Sometimes uh, when I just began being a missionary, and I was missionary in North America, in the U.S., I will go to, uh, to Mass on Sunday, and I will see a congregation of 700 people, one of those big churches, and everybody was there, very, very beautifully looking, and uh, very well behaved, and then time of communion came, everyone went to communion, everyone. There were somebody guiding, you see the communion lines and two or three people were guiding traffic there to the, to the communion. And uh, well, when I will ask the priest about confession, hardly anyone was going to confession for long, long periods of time. See, the percentage of confession was almost none. Like very few people will go to confession in a year to the point where confessions were announced like 30 minutes on Saturdays, right? And probably two people will show up for those 30 minutes. And uh, you were, I was asking myself, what are these people up to? I mean, how could they go to communion and never go to confession? What are they doing? They, they became like Protestants. They were, they were not sacramental anymore. I don't mean to say to put Protestants down. No, no, don't mean that. The thing is that they don't deal with the Eucharist and they just deal in a different way with the faith. So I was saying these people are not aware of what they have and the responsibilities they have. And it's so watered down. See, this sacrament of the Eucharist, when it is the center of our faith. See, it is our greatest responsibility. And, and what happened? People with time became so far away from the truth. And, and the Catholic Church in many places has, has become like a social church. See, a church of people, not a church of God. 
not a church of sacred traditions any longer, not a church of sane doctrine, and therefore is not a sacramental church any longer. And people are just very good people, very charitable, and, and they even get along. See, they, they even are good communities, but nothing to do with the mystery of the faith. See, the Eucharist is not even near to be what it's supposed to be. And that's why people are dealing with it in such a horrifying way, in such a irreverent way. And then adoration is practically non-existent in so many places. And if you see a priest uh, exposing the Blessed Sacrament, you know, uh, in, in the monstrance, they just come, like, just lay there, and when they put it down, you, they just put, like, uh, a stall here very rapidly, very fast, and put the Lord down and take it away. Or maybe a layman will do that, not even the priest. See, because the, the respect for the Eucharist is gone, is lost. For some people, what I'm saying, it's almost fanatical, right? Because that's how bad we're doing. It's like uh, fanaticism. It's like, oh, this guy is preaching the gospel of the bush, you know? This guy comes from the jungle. So this is uh, an old gospel. Because that's the, you know, one time I was in Madrid and I was giving a talk to a group of people in Madrid. And among them, there was their spiritual father. But, uh, I had no idea he was a priest because he was dressed up in civilian clothes, which is very, very common nowadays. And also, I, when I ended the talk, I was talking about the sacraments. And uh, so he stood up, everybody was looking up to him, he was the, the spiritual father. And he said, everything you said was really good. He reminded me of my grandmother. So he says, that the church was beautiful then. And it was a very religious church. It was a very important church for the history of the church. But we are living the day of today. Things have changed. Now it's very different. And he tried to give me this horrifying gospel. This horrifying gospel he made up. Well, I don't know who taught him that. But it was a horrible, disgusting gospel, right? where everything was supposed to be brought up to date, you know, like, like we have to live the day and even our faith had to be adjusted to the times. You know, before in the, the, the first reflection I gave you today, and the first reading, St. Paul was telling us, do not adjust yourself to people and to the times, just live within God. And the word of God will never pass, will never come to pass, and we have to live the truth, you know, we don't have to live up to this culture and adjust ourselves to this, to this world and to, this, to, to these changes. And uh, so this is something that's happening in the church. But I say, it's so important to understand the power of the Eucharist and the mystic of the Eucharist. I was saying before this morning that uh, we, when we get together as Christians and we pray together, we become a beam of light. And that beam of light is a caution for salvation of souls. Because we, as much as the devil, with his dark ways, provides a trap for souls, you know, that comes through music, art, literature, the internet, movies, who knows how many ways the devil uses to trap us. With this, I'm not condemning these areas I mentioned. I am an artist by craft, you know, and the art is beautiful and we can do wonders through art and literature and, and music and all of that. But I'm saying the devil uses everything. So the same way we use all of that for good and, and, and for goodness. And, and we, we become discussion of light for souls, or salvation of souls. So imagine the power of the Eucharist. When you come to communion, and you are truly prepared. Because look at the difference between a Catholic that is a Eucharistic instrument of reparation, because that's what we are, because of the Eucharist. Eucharistic instrument of reparation. When you come to communion, the condition for you to be a true vessel of the Eucharist is a preparation of the heart. That is the condition. You, it's, like, uh, it's like when you come to get married in the church. The church asks you to be prepared before that, right? You have a pre-marriage pre type of preparation from the church. 
That's what the church teaches you. So you learn what you're going to do and the responsibilities of the sacrament. And you come prepared for that sacrament. Same thing with the sacrament of communion. Uh, the Eucharist, you are prepared. So when you prepare yourself, that means that you went to confession and you recognize who you are, your misery, all your transgressions, and, and ask for forgiveness to God through this middleman, the priest, which is an incredible, <coughs> powerful gift. See, when I had my experience with God that brought me back into the faith, one of the things the Lord revealed to me was the sacrament of confession. And He said, the devil stole from me the Catholic <coughs> faith when I stopped going to confession because I refused to go to the middlemen. See, I said, why should I go to another human being for confession? I can go straight to Jesus. So this is the most logical thing to do. I don't need the middlemen. And I forgot important things like this. There is a passage in the scriptures, in the gospel, where Jesus appears to the apostles after resurrection, and he gives them the power to forgive sins or to retain them. He didn't give that power to every baptized Christian. He just gave that power to the apostles. See? And why? This is what I got from Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, in relationship to the sacrament. You, and it is based on obedience. You know, Jesus will heal the sick on the side of the road. And Jesus was God, is God. But he did something very peculiar after that. He will send the sick to the temple to be purified with the priest. Do you remember that? Why will he do that? He's God, that person is healed, he doesn't need to do anything else. But he will send them there. Those priests he will send the sick to, they were his enemies. They were looking to kill Jesus. They hated Jesus. And they were unfaithful priests. They were not even of God. But they were part of the temple of God. And then Jesus was in obedience to the Father. He was doing that because that was obedience to the Father. And he was teaching us that in spite of us, in, in spite of our humanity, we are to obey God above all things. So the middleman, the priest, is a big challenge for us because we have to humble ourselves to the stand that we have to overcome our pride and be able to go and confess our sins to another sinner. Imagine that really destroys the devil. Because the devil is the temple of pride. That's the devil. And then he will build you so powerful, you will say, I will not kneel and confess my sins to another sinner. That is probably a worse sinner than I am. And, uh, Especially today when they air all the dirty clothes of the church everywhere, right? So priests don't have a good reputation today. So it's even more difficult to go to them. But the truth is that this is an incredible mystical challenge. See, we by nature, because of mortality, because of original sin, we have a tendency to build ourselves really big, gigantically, you know? We are filled with yeast and spices. We are big blown up bread, right? And very tasty. And then what we need to do is we have to become unleavened. We have to become tasteless. We have to take all the yeast out, all the spices, become tasteless, and go to the altar of the Lord to be served as true food of life. See, only unleavened bread can be served on the altar of the Lord. So when you come to communion, you have to be empty of self. You have to take all the spices out and the yeast. How do you do that? By humbling yourself. You go to confession. See how important it is? It's not about religion. It's not about something people made up. It's not that the church came up with this. This was given and taught to us by Jesus himself. And he gave us the guidance as to how to be with him, within him, and for him, to live for him, to the sacraments, living a sacramental life. So the reconciliation is vital in the Eucharist. There's, there's, there couldn't be a real, true uh, relationship with the Eucharist if there is not a true relationship with the sacramental confession. 
There is no way you could ever have a relationship with the Eucharist that way. As a matter of fact, St. Paul says, do not dare to come to the altar of the Lord, to eat of this bread, meaning the Eucharist, if you are not prepared, because you will eat your own condemnation. Those are the words he uses. Man, there still are people that claim that that bread is a symbol. See? I have news for that. You know, this is what the Lord showed me in relationship with the true presence of the Eucharist, the, of Jesus in the Eucharist. You remember the disciples of Emmaus? Jesus is walking with them, and they don't know that is Jesus. But once everything was over and Jesus disappeared, they claimed, they said, Oh, remember our hearts were on fire when he was speaking. But they didn't know that was Jesus. When did they find out that it was Jesus? When? Only when he broke the bread. Right? And what was the message there? He showed, he showed us, he said, I am in the bread. I am there. There is where you're going to find me. And what happened right when he broke the bread? He disappeared from them, from their midst. So the word alone is not enough. Yes, the word will set you on fire. Those disciples of Emmaus were on fire because of the word. Because it was the word of God. So it's not enough just to proclaim the word of God. Hallelujah. It's not enough. We are not simply a Bible church. We are not only that. We are not only the word. We are a mystical church, a Eucharistic church. You have to become that bread. You have to go into that bread in order to make it happen. And the Word was made flesh. And what happened? And dwelt among us. How? Through the Eucharist. Because we eat that bread, and that bread becomes life in us. And that's what Jesus, when He said, you had to eat my flesh and drink my blood, they all run away. They say, why is this guy is crazy? He thinks we are cannibals, we want to eat him, right? But that's what they were claiming, and the apostles were there trembling, and He said, you can go too, if you want to. But then Peter came up with this incredible uh, sermon there saying, Oh no, you are the Son of God. And at the end, when, when Peter was over talking, Jesus said, That wasn't you. That was the Holy Spirit that got you to speak that. Say, so poor Peter wasn't even saying that. It was the Spirit of God that said that. So the apostles were petrified, thinking, do we have to eat him? See, it's like, I mean, this is big. This is really big. Even today, it will be big for people. See, after all we know, and after Jesus has resurrected, and we have the Holy Spirit, still a lot of people don't get it. A lot of people say he's not in the Eucharist. Imagine they, in, in big surveys um, of Catholics coming out of Sunday Mass, they have asked them, do you believe that Jesus is alive in the Eucharist? Over 50% of Catholics do not believe it. Imagine how sad that is. And we have incredible Eucharistic miracles to be shown in the church. You probably know many, right? How many? We have something very important that people think very little of, but it's, very, it's a very important witness. You know we have uncorrupted bodies, right? How do you think that they become uncorrupted? Why don't they corrupt? Because of the Eucharist. Nobody else can show an uncorrupted body. They can show a mummy, right? Yes, the Egyptians have many, and a lot of people have mummies, but uncorrupted bodies nobody has. Only the church has them because of the Eucharist. That's what it is. It's like a blood transfusion. We change this, this blood that is corrupted for the blood of Jesus. And at the end, even the body is left uncorrupted because it became the body of the Lord. Thus, those saints became Christ-like, as simple as that, through the Eucharist. So, the Eucharist is an incredible, incredible, incredible power. See, if we only will understand a little about this power, we will know that just by being simple, simple, plain Catholics, sacramental Catholics, obedient to the sacraments, that would be enough to be a powerful instrument of God. 
the rest of your life will be so important. You know how important it is a daily communicant. When you die as a Catholic, the biggest nightmare of your soul is to see all the wasted Eucharist. See, to see that you could have gone to the Eucharist so often and the souls that could have been rescued if you would have gone to communion all the times you could. See, when the Lord showed me the 32 years I didn't go to communion because I was falling away from the Catholic faith and the pain that I went through, I can only tell you that it is absolutely impossible to describe it. If I would have died that night and I would have made it to salvation, I would have probably spent centuries in purgatory just because of the pain of the Eucharist. Only that. And I'm not exaggerating. And the centuries I speak about are not human time. It's, it's very difficult to explain the difference between the time we are living and the space we are in and when we walk into the eternal presence of God. It has nothing to do with what we experience here as time. <coughs> nothing to do. It's beyond our understanding. But it is a relationship with conscience. You notice this. I'm going to give you an example. Just to give you a poor example as to what I'm saying. Very poor. But you, I'm sure you, the Holy Spirit is going to help you to relate to this. You know when you have a toothache, time stops, right? It seems like it's never going to go, that pain. It's forever. Especially if you have a toothache at 3 in the morning, right? It's like eternal, every second. It's like a, a year, see? And when you go into difficult times, time stops. It's like it's not moving. It's like everything is stuck. I mean, it's stuck. The time is not moving because things are difficult, because you are in pain, because of whatever you're going through that is not flowing. Then you're stuck and time changes. It's a different time. It's like uh, one guy, one of these prophets, end time prophets in New York, was in a TV show with me and they were uh, interviewing the two of us. I'm, I'm not very keen of, horror, of terror messages, right? I am very much for all the revelation, private revelations and, and the Lord speaks to us, you know. We have visionaries and prophets and we have all these gifts in the church for sure. But I think that we are the messengers of good news. Amen. I think that's who we are. Yes. We are not the messengers of Satan. We are not the messengers. Imagine, are you interested to find out what the thieves of Glasgow are, are up to today? Yes. I don't care what the thieves of Glasgow, they are up to no good. Yes. They're trying to steal from somebody, right? Yes. Are, are you interested in what the devil is up to with humanity? I mean, he's up to no good. Do you want to know? Do you want to know what he's up to? I don't want to know. I don't, I don't have any interest to know what the devil is up to. The only thing I'm interested to know is how I can stay away from him, right? And that is just being of God. So I want the good news. I want the good news of obedience, of being of God, and then I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about what the devil is up to. So I'm talking to these uh, end time messengers in, in, in this show, and he told me, haven't you noticed that time is going by much faster? Yes. So I said, oh really? I say, I just came from visiting a prison. I say, would you like to come with me and ask the prisoners if the time is going faster? <laughs> <laughs> See, it's nonsensical really, because all depends of what you are facing and what you're living. Go and ask someone that is going through pain in a hospital, right? To a terrifying pain. And ask them, haven't you noticed time is flying by? <laughs> oh, you will be slapped in the face. <laughs> because it's not the case, you know? <laughs> we, we couldn't figure life like that. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work, you know? But one thing is important, and, and it is that we have to realize how, how we have to deal with the gifts of the church. The gift of the Eucharist is such an immense gift, but it is connected to everything else. It is connected to everything else. Because um, when you understand that we are instruments of reparation, instruments of salvation of souls, and sometimes I have seen, see one time I was invited to a small town in Ohio, in the US, 
and this lady just met me through internet. I had no idea what she was. That happens a lot in my mission. And so I landed in Cincinnati, Ohio, and she picked me up in the airport and took me to this little town. And on the way there, she said, well, I didn't tell you before you come, but my church is a mess. So it's a new age church. The priest, everybody there is lost. So they're going to be really shocked with your testimony. I didn't tell them anything about your mystical experience. I just told them about the kidnapping, right? Your abduction from the guerrillas. That's all they know. And they are very excited about the action of the story. See? But they have no idea of the mystical spirit. I was going like, whoa. So I'm up to a good time here tonight. So, because I've been to some of those churches before, right? They want to kill you there. So I was giving my testimony, obviously. Half of the, of the, of the congregation there walked away. Little by little, they were walking away. And I was already warned by, those la by that lady. But during the talk, the Lord showed me at the very end of the church, in the last pew there on the left, right by the door, there was an old lady. And, and he said that whole church was being held on that lady. See? And those people in that church didn't even acknowledge that lady. See, she was completely despised, ignored by everybody. She was there every day. She was the column of that parish. One woman, one person. It reminds me of that talk that Abraham had with God. You remember about what if 20 are faithful? What if one is faithful? And then, see, this is what the Lord showed me. So, I'm trying to get across is the importance of understanding who we are eucharistically. See, a lot of people think they have to do a lot in order to just make a difference and try to save souls. But I tell you, being a Eucharistic instrument alone is the greatest job that we have been entrusted with. It's, that, it's the most amazing gift. This is how it works. If you prepare yourself well, mean, meaning you humble yourself and you go to confession and you, you bring your misery right in front of the Lord to the priest and say, and you say what you are about, you know, a sinner. See, I, I don't seem to get it together. I sin again, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, and it seems like I'm not ca incapable of stopping this. You know, look, I did it again. And uh, please forgive me. And then you go, you humble yourself. You understand who you are. And then the Lord forgives you and makes you new and, and sends Satan away. Because one of the greatest realizations about the Second of Confession is Every mortal sin is guarded by a fallen angel. And only the church has the power to unchain us from the devil. Only the church. Remember that Jesus gave the key to heaven to Peter, meaning to the church. And then gave the power to the apostles to forgive sins or to retain them. So Satan knows. Satan is hierarchical. He only understands military orders. He doesn't understand anything else. And he's not going to obey anybody that has no authority. So only the church has authority for that against him. And he has to obey. So we are completely delivered from him when we are absolved through the magisterium of the church. And then you come to communion. Once you receive the host, which is Jesus himself, then you become Christ-like at that very moment. That's how, that's how you become Christ-like. And the Lord pays with that blood that became Christ-like, pays for salvation of souls. Someone is dying around here and you are able to save that soul and rescue that soul through that Eucharist at that moment, with that communion. When you walk out of the church, you radiate that light. A lot of people are delivered. A lot of people are healed just when you walk out because you are a living tabernacle of the living God. You're not going to see that now, but you're going to see it when you face the Maker. That's what you came here to do. And we were created to be those Eucharistic instruments. So that alone, imagine if you combine that with a true renewal. Oh, that is powerful. Imagine 
the Eucharist and you understanding the mystic of the Eucharist and on top of that living a true renewal of your faith. That is beyond imagination of how powerful it is because you will be on fire. Then, then demons will flee just when you wake up, right? Even when you're sleeping. They don't want to get close. See, it's, it's like prayer, you know. We, we know that prayer is powerful. But check this out. In the eternal presence of God, Jesus is on the cross. See, because that moment is eternal. Jesus on Golgotha, on the cross. In the eternal presence of God, Jesus is there, on the cross. So what happened with the crucifix? If you are faithful to God, and this crucifix is blessed, right? What you're carrying is blessed, exercised, is, is anointed with the Spirit of God. Then the spirits that roam the air, they don't see a metal object or a physical object. They see Jesus on the cross. That's what they see. So that's what sacramentals are about. Imagine how powerful it is. You have a medal of Our Lady, and you are, and is blessed. That means he has the Holy Spirit already. You notice how witches, they incantate objects. They, 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 they put spells on objects. So those objects receive the spirit of the devil. And wherever you take those objects, those spirits are going to be working around. And the same thing happens with the sacramentals. When they are blessed, they have the Holy Spirit. And therefore, wherever you go, that presence is there. So when you have a medal, it's not a medal any longer after it's blessed. It's Our Lady alive. And this is very important. My time is up. Our, the priest already arrived. And I could keep you here for a long time speaking about the Eucharist, but we are just getting ready to receive it anyways. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a great gift of the Lord. So I praise the Lord. I want to just close with a, a short reading. And it's uh, St. Paul is speaking to Titus, and it's chapter 2, and it says, Live as responsible persons. Let your words strengthen sound doctrine. Tell the older men to be sober, serious, wise, sound in faith, love, and perseverance. The older woman in like manner must behave as befits holy women, not giving to gossiping or drinking wine, but as good counselors able to teach younger women to love their husbands and children, to be judicious and chaste, to take care of their households, to be kind and submissive to their husband, lest our faith be attacked. Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Set them an example by your own way of doing. Let your teaching be earnest and sincere, and your preaching beyond reproach. Then your opponents will feel ashamed and will have nothing to criticize. Amen. Amen. Amen.